It's time for CES 2022, taking place in Las Vegas, Nevada. This year's already scaled back event has been plagued with last minute cancellations, but there were still plenty of announcements expected, starting with Tuesday's trio of keynotes from AMD, Nvidia, and Intel, all taking place within a few hours of each other. I'll be recapping them all, trimming the fat, and dishing you out the good parts first, starting with Dr. Lisa Su's 7 a.m. Rise and Shine rundown of what's in store for AMD, which is a little bit less than expected. Then on to Nvidia's phoned in presentation that Jensen didn't even deem important enough to participate in personally, and finishing with Intel, who had a window of opportunity to score a win over Team Red and Team Green if only their presentation hadn't been woefully short on substance as well. For viewers at home, though, one question looms. Which keynote was most disappointing? I'd like to somehow answer all of them. Excellent! We'll start with AMD, whose CEO Lisa Su was gracious enough to bless us with her presence on stage, even though it started at 7 a.m., which is just way too early. CES happens in Las Vegas, guys. 7 a.m. is when people there usually go to bed, just FYI. And while AMD's presentation started with the usual broad and general statements about PCs, the cloud, gaming, and supercomputers, they did follow that up with a range of hardware announcements. Ryzen 6000 series mobile CPUs with integrated RDNA 2 graphics, the Radeon RX 6500 XT discrete GPU that will list for $200, updates to their mobile GPU lineup with the introduction of the 6000S series, and new CPUs they'll be launching this year, starting with the 5800X3D, the first Zen 3 CPU with 3D vCache, and a teaser for Zen 4, which will be 5 nanometer based and power the Ryzen 7000 series of CPUs in the second half of this year. So that seems like a healthy stack of hardware announcements, but why would it be disappointing? Let's look at these in reverse order from how they were announced, beginning with the Zen 4 based Ryzen 7000 CPUs and the new AM5 platform. We have official confirmation now that AM5 will use an LGA 1718 socket, that's land grid array rather than the PGA or pin grid array socket that AM4 currently uses, with shots of both a CPU with an interesting looking heat spreader and the socket itself. We're promised PCI Express Gen 5 and DDR5 support, and they showed a Halo Infinite demo proving that, yes, their lab samples are functional and can run games, which is good and they said that while gaming, the Zen 4 cores were running at 5 GHz. The AM5 socket update will still be backwards compatible with AM4 coolers, which is nice, and the new platform and CPU lineup is still on the roadmap for the second half of 2022. Not bad so far, some confirmation of rumors that have floated around for quite a while now, and while a late May Computex launch doesn't seem in the cards for AM5, later this year is still what most people have been expecting for that platform. Then there's the Ryzen CPUs with 3D vCache, first announced at Computex 2021 with some good fanfare, as the die stacking tech is expected to provide a 10 to 15% uplift in CPU limited gaming frame rates. The disappointing news is that AMD announced just one CPU in this lineup, the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D, an 8 core 16 thread CPU with 64 megabytes of added 3D vCache to supplement the 32 megabytes that the regular 5800X already had. The X3D runs slower than a 5800X. 800X2 with the 3.4 GHz base clock and a 4.5 GHz boost clock versus the non-3D chip that hits 3.8 and 4.7, and while it will work with existing 400 series and 500 series motherboards, it's not expected until spring 2022, which sounds like a pushback to me versus the Q1 availability that many were expecting. Spring lasts until June 21st this year, so even if AMD now says they have the fastest gaming CPU in the world versus Intel's 12900K that recently took back that crown at the end of 2021, if it's not available until June, that's still five plus months away, and we still don't know if or when other Zen 3 CPUs will be added to this stack, or if this will just be a one-off to tide us over until Zen 4 launches later in the year. Beyond the CPU announcements that most hardware enthusiasts were interested in, AMD also announced new mobile CPUs, and here they are using the Ryzen 6000 series nomenclature that many expected to be used for the 3D vCache chips. There are 10 new mobile Ryzen 6000 CPUs for next-gen notebooks launching in February, based on updated Zen 3 Plus cores manufactured on TSMC's 6 nanometer process. Notably, these mobile CPUs feature integrated RDNA 2 graphics with up to 12 compute units, hardware ray tracing support, and double the cache versus last gen, as well as CPU boost clocks up to 5 GHz, and a Microsoft Pluton security coprocessor that works with Windows 11. The new platform for these laptops supports 40 gigabits per second USB 4, as well as DDR5 and LPDDR5 compatibility, Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.2, and PCI Express 4.0. 
not quite 5.0, but still good. There's also some nice add-ons like a hardware AV1 decoder, HDMI 2.1, and DisplayPort 2.0 compatibility as well. Laptop designs from Acer, Asus, Alienware, HP, Lenovo, and Razer are already being shown off, so there should be plenty available next month. And then we'll see if AMD's performance claims that range from 24-hour battery life to double the gaming performance and 69% better video editing versus last gen, nice, are accurate. AMD's Radeon team has also been working on new stuff, and we at last have official confirmation of the RX 6500 XT, a $200 MSRP discrete graphics card that will be available January 19th. And while part of me scoffs and says, sure AMD, available for about 20 seconds before scalper bots scoop them up. On some level, I do appreciate that this card exists and that AMD still sees some reason to list it for $200. It's also built on TSMC's six nanometer process and ships with 16 compute units, a 2.6 gigahertz game clock, 16 megabytes of infinity cache, and an undisclosed amount of VRAM although it's probably four gigabytes and AMD is just embarrassed to say that outright, so they'd rather lead with it having 16 megabytes of infinity cache instead. Reactions to this card seem varied, with some feeling positive that a $200 MSRP 6000 series card has even been discussed in 2022, and others comparing it to the RX 580, which will likely have similar performance even though it launched in April 2017, also for $200 for a four gig card. It was actually more like $240 for the eight gig version of the RX 580, but uh, you see my point here. Rounding things out, there are also new discrete mobile Radeon GPUs launching, starting with the Radeon RX 6000S Slim series for gaming on thin and light laptops. The 6800S, 6700S, and 6600S are optimized for a balance between power and efficiency, as opposed to the Radeon 6000M lineup of discrete mobile GPUs that are more performance oriented. The 6000M lineup still exists and will also be getting new models, such as the RX 6850MXT, to provide more options for laptop OEMs and customers. Oh, and there will be a new Radeon Adrenaline software update coming in Q1 that will enable Radeon Super Resolution, which is powered by FSR or Fidelity FX Super Resolution, but works with thousands of games at the driver level, even if the game developers haven't added FSR directly. So like I said, quite a few hardware announcements, not all of them useless, and indeed some good developments for laptop users, especially if you use a laptop for gaming, and maybe more people will be doing that in the future if DIY PC building remains so cost prohibitive, but I can't help but being a little salty about those 3D vCache CPUs being so scarce and not coming out for several months still. I was anticipating a quicker response to Intel's Alder Lake launch at the end of 2021. Perhaps Nvidia, whose keynote kicked off at 8 a.m., can turn things around. Ah, I see Jensen didn't even bother to show up, so let's temper our expectations. Indeed, I can now reveal to you guys that I was planning to make three separate videos today, one on each keynote, because I thought the announcements might warrant that kind of thing. But after watching them, I decided just one video would probably do. SVP Jeff Fisher from the GeForce team walked us through the usual starting off points though, you know, the broad and generalized statements and statistics about gaming and the gaming industry and why it is so important to NVIDIA, which is odd to me because the core PC gaming audience doesn't seem very happy with NVIDIA or the GPU industry in general right now. So Jeff, leading the keynote with GeForce Now stuff that the hardware community really doesn't care about, just strikes me as NVIDIA really leaning into the idea of people renting their PC gaming hardware rather than owning it outright in the future. And maybe that's where the industry is heading, but I still hold out hope for something that is more in the interest of individual gamers than what will make companies like NVIDIA the most money. The contrast is stark though. NVIDIA really puffed up the visuals of their presentation with as much gaming footage as humanly possible, posting more stats about how huge the gaming industry is than they did stats about their own hardware, as if to taunt us with a world of gaming possibilities that could be within our reach if only there were actual GPUs to buy at reasonable prices. Oh look, it's more RTX on on off and DLSS on off demo footage, but with different and new games now like Rainbow Six Extraction. It sure would be nice if a GPU that supported that tech was available for less than 600 bucks. Seriously, there were just so many game trailers. Games are cool and no doubt RTX and DLSS and Reflex will continue to be added to new games, but it just seems like a distraction from the lack of details on new hardware and GPUs. More than 16 minutes into Nvidia's show, 
they finally talked about a new GPU, the RTX 3050, which will feature eight gigabytes of GDDR6 memory and be available in board partner designs starting January 27th for a base price of $250. Now I've said Nvidia seems to be avoiding talking about their discrete GPUs in this presentation, but I went back and timed it. This announcement took 30 seconds and then it was done. I'm pretty sure it was the shortest bit on a new GPU ever during a keynote, at least in my experience. Beyond that, Nvidia talked a bit about their fourth gen Max-Q standards for gaming laptops, which include the addition of a CPU optimizer, rapid core scaling, and Battery Boost 2.0, which should pair nicely with the two laptop GPUs that they also debuted, the RTX 3080 Ti for laptops with 16 gigabytes of GDDR6, and a $2,500 starting price, that's for a whole laptop with one, not just the graphics card, and the RTX 3070 Ti laptop edition, which they didn't bother listing VRAM specs for for some reason, but has a $1,500 starting price, again, that's for an entire laptop. Both will be compatible with 4th Gen Max-Q, and the CPU optimizer should work with Intel Alder Lake 12th Gen or the newly announced AMD Ryzen 6000 Rembrandt mobile CPUs. And even though Jensen wasn't there, Jeff did add just one more thing, the RTX 3090 Ti, which he erroneously called the 3090 Ti, extending that meme, but also confirming the new fastest gaming GPU that Nvidia has on deck, with 40 shader teraflops of power, 78 ray tracing tera tera teraflops, 24 gigabytes of 21 gigabits per second GDDR6X memory, and that's all. Tune in later this month for more details on the 3090 Ti, said Jeff, before kicking things over to the AI and automotive part of the presentation that I didn't bother watching. One more thing that I did note though, was this comment from Hardware Connects regarding public enthusiasm for PC hardware. There were 15 to 20,000 viewers for Nvidia's YouTube CES 2022 keynote versus 100,000 plus last year. Nvidia might be shipping more units than ever thanks to bulk sales to brokers and crypto mining operations, but they'd better hope the fans who are actual PC gamers come back if that crypto gravy train ever dries up. And then there was Intel. Team Blue had so much hope, so much potential leading into this, with a bit of momentum on the CPU side thanks to Alder Lake not being completely terrible, and countless eager gamers looking for a GPU solution after struggling through such a long shortage. We hoped to hear a lot more about ARC desktop GPUs that might provide a solution for some of those gamers. And while Intel client computing EVP Greg Bryant, aka GB, did a good job emceeing the show, and I appreciate that this felt a little bit more live like a CES presentation versus the more polished and edited AMD and NVIDIA keynotes, uh, there was a surprising lack of substantive announcements versus our expectations. So first, as expected, Intel has announced a bunch more Alder Lake CPUs. The launch at the end of 2021 only included unlocked desktop K SKUs and the Z690 chipset motherboards, and we now have 22 more LGA 1700 options to choose from, from Pentiums and Celerons, all the way up to i9 12900s, with varying P-Core and E-Core counts and power ranges. Performance of these CPUs will all be derivative to some degree of the performance of the K-SQ CPUs that's already been measured, launched in 2021, like the 12900K, depending on the core counts, cache allocation, and the frequencies that these new CPUs run at. These can also now be paired with less expensive motherboards based on the H670, B660, and H610 chipsets, which do not support overclocking and therefore pair well with non-K-SQ CPUs. The less expected announcement in this lineup is the 12th Gen Core KS series desktop CPU that they also teased, which they say run at 5.5 gigahertz. And indeed, they had a demo that showed what we assume is a 12900KS hitting 5.2 gigahertz all core and 5.5 gigahertz on two cores. So that's cool. And these are expected by the end of this quarter. So Q1 2022. Personally, I see these as a push to match or beat AMD's 3D vCache enabled 5000 series CPUs. But since those likely won't be out for a while still, Intel has some time to push their gaming performance up even a little bit further. Along with those desktop Alder Lake CPUs, there are a lot of mobile CPUs expected as well, and Intel will be starting with eight new 12th Gen Core H series CPUs for laptops that support up to 14 cores each. Intel says there are 20 new laptop designs based on the 12th Gen Core H series, which have a 45 watt TDP, and then later this year, they'll be launching the 28 watt P series and the super efficient U series mobile CPUs for the thinnest and lightest laptops in the lineup. So there are a lot of new Intel CPUs, but the architecture's base performance is already a known factor, and most of them were anticipated based on how Intel has created CPU product stacks in the past. It's also worth noting that with the hybrid P-cores and E-cores design, 
as well as the various lineups of desktop and mobile parts, it gets pretty confusing pretty quickly when attempting to determine which CPU might actually best suit your needs. There was, thankfully, at least a passing reference to Raptor Lake, though, Intel's successor to Alder Lake that is still expected later in 2022. And then, Lisa Pierce took the stage to talk about discrete GPUs. Hooray! Let's get those juicy details on Arc. So here it is. We now know, for sure, confirmed from Intel, that Intel Arc GPUs are shipping to OEMs. And laptops with discrete Arc GPUs exist. That's all. No model names, nothing beyond Intel Arc GPU listed alongside a 12th gen core CPU, and definitely a bit of a focus on laptop and mobile solutions amongst the over 50 system designs from their partners that they showed off. And yes, a few of those look like desktop PCs, but unless you're interested in Intel Deep Link that can be used when you have an Intel CPU and GPU combo, that's all they really told us. Deep Link, just FYI, features a dynamic power sharing mode and a hyper encode feature that splits encoding work between your discrete GPU and your integrated GPU for up to 1.4 times encoding performance improvement, which again, are cool and all and very similar to Nvidia's and AMD's full platform features that they're developing. But Intel, I was really, really expecting more about Arc than the fact that GPUs exist and it is still coming Q1 2022. But there you have it guys, my breakdown of the important stuff and the not important stuff in the main keynote presentations at CES 2022. And like I said, I was disappointed, but in the end, I guess I'd rather be let down by a CES keynote than the actual hardware that launches. And much of that remains to be seen in the coming weeks and months. Rather than looking at this like a letdown to start the year, I'm going to view it as a reasonable starting off point for a year that will hopefully get better as time goes by. That's all the time I have for this one though, but please feel free to leave me a comment down in the comment section. Let me know if you felt the same way that I did after these keynotes ended. And if you enjoyed this video, maybe click the like button. Check out my store at paulshardware.net for a selection of excellent merchandise options and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more tech videos in the future. Thanks as always for watching everyone and we'll see you in the next video.